So I just want to say that um, we are very, very honored here at Montserrat Galleries and Montserrat College of Art to present this talk tonight in conjunction with the exhibition that we have on view in Montserrat Gallery of Samuel Bach and the Art of Remembrance. Um, this, it was made possible through the incredible foresight of President Montserrat's President Kurt Steinberg, who also had technical problems trying to get in tonight. Um, and I'm sure he would like to um, make some remarks and we will um, just note that his, um, it is because he, um, knew that this exhibition would be important and it, it was really through his energies that made it possible and also through the cooperation of Pucker Gallery in Boston who were incredibly indebted to. Um, before, I introduce our, um, before I introduce Sam formally, I would like to thank our supporters for the exhibition, including Barbara and Jim Shea, Mercedes Sherrod Evans and David L. Evans and the Robert I. Ch Lappin Charitable Foundation, as well as the ongoing support of the Massachusetts Cultural Council. Samuel Bach was born in 1933 in Vilna, Poland at a crucial moment in modern history. From 1940 to 1944, Vilna was first under uh, Soviet then German occupation. While both he and his mother survived, his father and four grandparents tragically perished at the hands of the Nazis. But at the end of World War II, he and his mother fled to the Landsberg Displaced Persons Camp where he began to take art classes and a career in the art really blooms. Bach continued his, his studies following his immigration to Israel and he later received a grant to pursue his studies in Paris. In 1959, he moved to Rome where his first exhibition of abstract paintings met with considerable success. In 1961, he was invited to exhibit at the Carnegie International in Pittsburgh. And in 1963, two one-man exhibitions were held at the Jerusalem and Tel Aviv museums. It was subsequent to these exhibitions during the years 1963 to 1964 that a major change in his art occurred. There was a distinct shift from abstract forms to a metaphysical figurative means of expression. Ultimately, this transformation crystallized into his present pictorial language. Since 1959, Samuel Bach has had solo exhibitions at private galleries everywhere, including New York, Boston, London, Paris, Berlin, Munich, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Zurich, Rome, and other cities around the world. Numerous large retrospective exhibitions have been held in major museums, universities, and public institutions around the globe. Publications on Samuel Bach's work include 12 books, most notably a 400-page monograph entitled Between Worlds, and his touching memoir, Painted in Words. He has also been the subject of two documentary films. And with that very, very brief biography, I'd like to just welcome Samuel Bach with us tonight. Thank you, thank you. It's wonderful to be with you. It's wonderful to be with you. And um, uh, while we are waiting <laughs> for the other uh, participants to appear on the screen, let me, let me tell you uh, something um, that is very quite important to me. You mentioned before my passage from abstraction to um, mm -hmm. figurative uh, painting, uh, figuration in a very kind of metaphorical, allegorical system. I must say that when I started my career as an artist, I was um, somehow divided between being a stage designer and being a painter. Now, when you paint, you're alone in the studio. And when you send away the paintings, you do not see the people who see the paintings. While when you are a stage designer, you work with actors, you work with, um, with uh, directors, uh, with the people who execute the scenery. There is a, 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 a give and take that is instantaneous. And I must say, that till this very day, I miss it, but it is very difficult to do the two things properly. So at a certain point, I gave up. But I must say that um, in abstraction, I was able to express feelings. I was able to give ideas to shapes and so on. I wasn't sure how they will get to people. 
And I very much wanted to communicate and I very much wanted to tell a story that I had mm -hmm. because I, I think that I had a very important story. I had a very important st story because I, wore, I was born on the day that Hitler came to power in Germany. Mm -hmm. And I have experienced, not by my own choice, one of the most horrible tragedies that happened to humanity. I was able to witness what happens when people get to the best and the worst of what life can push them. And I saw that there are some things to tell about it. And there are also some things to tell about the people, the survivors in, in, in whose company I lived for years. And, um, and also somehow dedicate my work for the uh, presence of a memory that has to be nourished mm -hmm. in order not to be forgotten. So all these things have very much inspired the paintings that uh, we, were, we will see most probably on the screen if the technology allows us. I and can, I can I tell you something about these um, paintings. Uh, uh, so it is certainly, I'm missing very much Bernie right now. I don't see him on my screen. I don't know if you have him on yours. Yes, he may. It may just be the two of us, Samuel. So we'll just we'll okay. Just but going. we can I do have um, we share, can continue so. with the things. I mean, uh, uh, Bernie actually is a much better um, commentator and mm -hmm. introducer of my work than I am, because usually artists feel a little shy about speaking of their own work, and it is quite mm -hmm. natural because people look at what you have done, and then you you feel that you have to apologize of having taken up their time and their interest and say, well, but anyway, I, I have no difficulty speaking about my art. Uh, and um, we, can, uh, we can start if you wish so. Yes, let's, We can start uh, to look at the images. We can go from the first painting, which is on a, in a group of paintings that you chose um, to, to speak about. And then we will hope Okay, that, very good. Uh, our partners will arrive. Okay. All right, so I'm going to try to share my screen here. Um, okay. okay. The first painting. Uh, should be, yes, it's persistence. It's persistence and um, uh, it is a painting about books. Well, to say, first of all, uh, Jews were considered the people of the book. And um, this is a painting that uh, definitely deals with the Holocaust, with the memory of thousands of synagogues, big and small, that were destroyed. Um, what people did in these synagogues was mostly learning mm -hmm. because they used to go to the synagogue to learn from the books, books that contain in them wisdom of centuries. Now, all this was destroyed and not because books mm -hmm. have remained and beside a very personal um, experience of myself where I have survived hiding among books because at a certain point of my life uh, with my mother and another number of Jews, we were in a convent that was taken up by the Rosenberg um, organization. The Rosenberg organization was a Nazi organization that was um, collecting artifacts and books of the Jewish um, civilization <laughs> that they wanted proudly put in a museum to show, look at the people that we kind of liberated the world from. And these were their, this was their stuff. Mm -hmm. So they were collecting books and, uh, and, and some uh, slave laborers of the ghetto who were doing the work for them have created among the books a hiding place. And I have survived thanks to this hiding place, hiding between thousands, many thousands of books that were 
piled up in corridors and in rooms and so on, and we had a little niche. So mm -hmm. personally, also because I've always been a, a reader, <laughs> my education is mostly an education of reading books. Um, I, uh, I have dedicated this painting to contain all these thoughts that I have now uh, shared with you. Um, and um, we can go on uh, to the next image. Mm -hmm. Before that, what I wanted to say um, about my speaking of my art is, please do not see in it the only way of seeing art. Because what I want people to do when they see a painting of, of mine is first of all, bring themselves to it. See what it evokes in them and everything that it brings to their mind is fine. What I am doing, I'm trying to enrich it with some footnotes of, mm -hmm. of, of what has created them, of the, of the raison d'etre, of the reason of being of, of these things as they are. So let's let's go to the next painting, and uh, I don't even remember what it is, but sure, uh, sure. <laughs> I will I will see what I can. Yes. Now but this is yeah the dreamers and their artists. This is one I think of my most enigmatic paintings that I ever created. In uh, what way? Tell, tell I, more I, about that. I, I I really wonder myself when I look at it because I painted it in '99, and I think the word "dreamers" that for us today has something extremely clear. And I I I must say I have myself experienced a contact with dreamers that I never thought of possible when I painted this painting about 20, what, 1, 22, 23 years ago. I. Uh, I, I was at the University of Ohio and, and, um, and they had a group, a large group of students that were studying among creative uh, writings, my memoir called Painted in Words. Mm -hmm. And I looked at them and many of them were Asians. Many of them were looked Latinos. And I was wondering, my book is, tell, is telling the story of a family of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, of Jews in Vilna. What do they feel about all that and about the boy that I describe in that book? And then I realized that they identified with me fully because many of them were dreamers and many of them were very uncertain about where they were and what their rights were, where they, they did not belong to the privileged class of, 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 of the white skin and so on. And, and I felt very, very moved by, 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 the, by the dreamers that suddenly gave to me another notion <laughs> of, of what I am painting, because I'm painting here, there is here, somebody is showing a painting, but the painting is, is something physical. It can be torn up, it can, it can disappear with time. And, and there is an idea of night to the right of the painting. There is a, a suggestion of somebody who's, who sleeps. There is also a, a little suggestion of an eye that opens. It is, lets us observe the world as it is. What can we learn from these things? I think when we think about things, when we open to things that we see, we can reach the skies and so on. Mm -hmm. And to help reaching the skies, I have put in some letters mm -hmm. <laughs> into that painting. So it is an ambiguous painting, but I am, um, I won't speak about it too much. I will really let the people try and figure out what it says. And when you are com composing a painting like this, and which has so many wonderful, interesting angles in which to sort of enter visually, you have these sort of prone uh, sort of uh, head at the bottom, a, a head that is sort of appearing behind and on a painting figures, the supporting canvases, 
with wings and this yeah. and the in the man conversant. So when you're composing a painting like this, thinking about the creative process as a restorer and as a witness, um, what what tell a little bit like it, using this painting as an example, thinking about how like how you would go about uh, or, or or what sort of process you are um, engaged in sort of putting together these different ideas and images. Yeah, you, you touch a very, a very um, important question to which I can hardly have an adequate answer because this is the matter of the uh, creative process. Now, the creative process is, 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 is an extremely complex thing. Um, you can do it intellectually, you can decide I'm doing this and that, which has such and such a meaning, and it will like, I don't know, like in a rebus, say something with something else and so on. Or you can let another partner into your doing, which is your subconscious. You let your hand kind of... Uh, wonder on the surface, do something. Usually the painting starts as a line drawing. So the subject, the subject materializes when, when I start with a very small and uncertain vision and I try to give an outline to the things. And then usually I'm trying to finalize and to have a good sense of what I'm going to do, how I'm going to proceed. Sometimes it happens that when a painting has already quite advanced, I see that the best part, best part of it, I mean, in, in, in the painterly sense, is just not right. And I, I take it out and I do something mm -hmm. else. So it is, it, 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 it kind of evolves. When I begin a painting, and, and I'm now speaking of, of an experience of painting that I have started to, to create art when I was three or four years of age. When I was four, my family already considered me a painter. So today at 88, I'm speaking of about 84 years of painting. <laughs> so that, that is a, that's, it's, it's, it's quite a heavy load to have on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. And I try every day, every morning, I try to discover what it is, discover what it is that I am doing. Uh, somehow um, uh, connect with something in me that I can only understand once I have done it and it is finished. Okay. Oh, we I are, see we Mr. Have Parker. Mr. Bernie Parker. I'm there, thank you. Well, finally, we are yes. there. Bernie, I missed you very much. Well, we, <laughs> we only very... just started, so we are so thankful oh, that you're we are, to we are already speaking. Um, the important thing is that you call the train, even if uh, it, uh, you had to go not to another station. But right. uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy I found you. Uh, you are there. <laughs> okay. And uh, you can look into the little square to see how we see you. And, okay. See that? Good now. That's better. Good. That's much better now. Okay. So I was speaking. I was speaking about the dreamers, and I was yep. speaking about um, the creative process and how I get to paint the way I am. I am painting. So uh, let us maybe go to number three, and uh, let there Bernie uh, speak about it. So I'm not sure what artist I'm talking about. No, Sam, I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Sorry, and I, I, I got in for the last movement, I think, given the title of this. Yes. But yes. what I really wanted to say, and I said at the opening, is the reality of Sam Bach is totally transformed from the reality of all of us. And therefore, you invite us into a space and into a discussion about what is fundamentally about our humanness that is both flawed and has potential. And this particular image and the number of images you have done of musicians speaks directly to the transformation of horror into beauty and beauty back into horror. So the notion that creative activities took place in the midst of the Holocaust um, when Messiaen wrote the Quartet for the End of Time 
the notion that even in, in the midst of all that, creativity took place, what went on at Terrazine. And you find a way to engage us in that conversation on an ongoing basis. This piece particularly um, represents that in a very, very important way. Yes, I would, I would say that um, uh, for me personally, my first exhibition was in the ghetto of, of, of Vilna. I was nine years of age and there was a, a moment in the ghetto, it lasted for about a year and a half or maybe even a little less, that uh, the Nazis have already uh, um, reduced the population of the ghetto of uh, 50,000 or so to, um, to 19,000. And then they decided these 19,000 will remain. We won't go on killing them massively. They just killed a few people every day, but that was the reality. And at that time, there was this kind of quiet period in the ghetto. People started in the evenings to reunite, to play music, to read poetry, to uh, play even jazz, to create choirs and so on. Creativity and art became incredibly important. And I decided to have an exhibition of the painters that are in the ghetto. And I had my first exhibition in the ghetto of Vilna when I was nine years of age. And, and somehow this need that we have for art, the need that, 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 that we have for something that allows us to communicate, to think, to look at things with a different view, to discover our own riches and so on, all these things came into those paintings. I, um, I certainly came to the idea of the quartet of the end of time of Messian when I was listening as a student in Paris to the lectures of Messiaen on music. Wow. And, and I knew that in the camp of prisoners with the four instruments that they had there, it was a, a camp of prisoners of war, um, he wrote music that has remained, that is being played till this very day. And, 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 and this power of art and what it can allow us to humanize ourselves, which is exactly what the, what the, what the Nazis try to destroy. This has remained a very important subject for me. So this is one of a good number of quartets that I have painted because the quartet has also uh, somehow uh, represented for me uh, the collaboration of, of the four voices <laughs> <laughs> of the of the human of the human sound from the soprano to the bass but also sam if people look carefully at it and i love the fact that it's on the screen in front of them one of them is shrouded in the very back and almost like a lean to or a tent and the others are all fabricated out of stone out all of fabricated wood. yeah and so I think your ability to create that notion, and then at the same time, both the music on the ground, all the sheets of music are blank. So how do we come to this with what we have, what we possess in our own world, and at the same time understand that there is a world devoid of all these possibilities made in that way by other human beings? So I think we can go to the next one, but this painting yeah. and the way it looks is so beautiful because nature is spectacular in this piece. Yeah, <laughs> the nature is inspired actually by the idea of the universal landscape that was practiced by Breuchel, by Patinier, by the painters of the 16th century. And it is my tribute and my thanks to them and saying, you know, we are humans, we will remain humans. Uh, I have a, a great admiration for Breuchel. I think that Breuchel lived in a country that was occupied by a foreign army. And when he described the, the massacre of the innocents with his, always his beautiful and universal landscapes behind, you can see soldiers of the Spanish army killing children. And, um, 
so I mean, uh, you can speak for hours on each one of these subjects because they uh, they are very far reaching. Absolutely. So then the next one. So well, this is very, from uh, this is from the, the series on, um, I think, hope um, or your right. version of hope. Right. Um, and your own journey, at least as I've experienced it um, along the way with you for the last 54 years, is in part from, it seems to me, recognition of the reality of evil, slowly, slowly, slowly accepting the reality of us needing in our lives hope of some kind, whether it's an illusion or not. And so here, these two opposite figures um, essentially um, trapped within this universe with the word hope spelled out. If you look carefully on the wall, the H, the O, the P inside of it, and the E. And I always love the fact that people will come into the gallery and say, Mr. Box's world seems so broken and so sad and hopeless. And my response is, well, here he's put hope in a, virtually all these paintings. That's right. And actually, these two people that uh, sit there, they're sitting there in front of them is a precipice. So it's very difficult for them to connect, but they still can, if they try, speak and shout to each other. Maybe, maybe um, uh, I should have painted them, but had I known uh, wearing masks, it would have been safer and more hopeful. <laughs> but, uh, well, they're at least six was, feet apart. This was painted many years ago. But um, actually, I was taken by these um, subjects very much because I think that hope, even in a hopeless situation, is something that gives us the, the strength and the power to, to go on and to do our thing. And even if everything seems so black and, 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 and uh, tragic, we still, we still believe in miracles, as the famous saying of Ben-Gurion goes, uh, whoever does not believe in miracles is not a realist. That's a lovely thing. But again, before we leave this, look at the way the water is painted. You don't need to look at it, Sam, you painted it. But those who are joining in, how beautiful is a sense of shimmering beauty that uh, could encourage the naive belief that hope works. Yes, yes. And there is also always also, I, I want to say people who look at this painting to think that these paintings are made of shapes or forms. They are in a composition. And when I have painted the big O, which is a kind of, I would say is, is, is a beginning of a structure of the underground in Vilna uh, through which so many people passed by escaping the ghetto, returning to the ghetto and so on. So these enormous uh, pipes of, 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 of concrete that were creating the underground where the wastewater of Vilna was flowing had also people walking in them. And then when I painted this big O, I thought, well, now I need, I need some other curbs in another direction. So this is why the waves of the sea came in and they respond <laughs> to the circle. They create a, 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 a counterpoint <laughs> to that. Oh, this is just saying that when I paint, I think of all the things of the meaning of the sense, but also of the composition of the shapes of the, of the music that is created visually. It's a wonderful way to remind people that although these paintings are filled with content and questions, they are also works of art. Thank you. Let's go on, next painting. <laughs> well, <laughs> Both of us are laughing because of the improbability of your deduction. But <laughs> I, I just love the notion again. So the background, I assume you haven't shared about the cup and saucer and uh, yes. your experience in Ghetto Vilna when the two poets took you to see this adult artist 
and yeah. he was no longer there. What stood in the studio was a painting of a cup, a saucer, and a spoon. And right. subsequently, you must have painted close to 100 or more right. images. Right. When you shared that with me and I looked at them with you, I was incredulous. <laughs> a cup. And then you took that image of uh, an innocent cup and look what you've done to us. Yes, it has, it, it evokes in me personally so many, so many very different memories. The cup. Uh, basically, yes, it is the memory of the painter in the ghetto of Vilna who um, was supposed to be my uh, painting teacher. And when I was brought there to his to the place where he lived in the ghetto, uh, I was told that the day before or so he was taken away by the police and was probably sent to be executed. And um, I'm telling this story in my book called Painters in Words, uh, where I tell all the stories. But, but the cup has also something that is related to hope, because for instance, there is in a, in a certain culture, there is a way of drinking a cup of coffee. And then when the, when the cup is, 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 is uh, empty and there is a deposit in various shapes, uh, in the cup itself. There are some people who have a whole knowledge how to tell you about the future of your life according to the shapes in the cup. And when, for instance, I don't even know, Bernie, if I told you that, uh, when I came to Israel and had my first exhibition in Israel in 66, it was an incredible success. I never expected it, but actually it sold out. Now, the, 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 the lady who was then the director of that gallery, who brought me there, her name was Ethel Breuder. She later was the director of the Israel, America Israel Cultural Foundation in New York. Right. And she invited me, and she invited me to her home, where there were a few more people, and she told each one of us, now imagine that you are in a garden all by yourself, an abandoned garden, and you find a cup in that garden. Now come and describe to me the cup that you have found. It was a kind of a social game, but it became much more serious because every person that was in that meeting was describing a cup or a part of a cup or something about a cup that spoke a lot of himself. And, and then suddenly the cup became a kind of a Rorschach cup, <laughs> which was describing people's personalities. And when I painted this specific painting, I thought of the unknown man. You don't see his face, his face is covered, <laughs> is hidden by a part over that cup and all he desires in that world that is falling apart, that goes to pieces and so on, is to sit quietly and enjoy a cup of coffee because he feels that what counts is how I live now in this very moment. <laughs> That's a lovely way to say it. I think basically uh, given television shows and movies, we should have, at least you should have put the name of the coffee so that there would be <laughs> placement rights for it. But actually, absolutely. And then there is the part of it with the tree uh, somehow both feeling uprooted above it that yeah. creates an instability beside all the brokenness of the cup itself. And in many other images of the cup, just for people's general reference, the handle of the cup is so often used as a question mark. Because at the end of the day, virtually every one of your questions, any every one of your paintings is a series of questions and never of answers, as much as you and I pretend we know what we're talking about. Sure, sure. And then if I can uh, just another remark, I mean the, the shards of this huge cup that uh, was broken are still kept together because what was broken and so on should not be forgotten. We should not throw it away. We have to keep and remember and, and maybe try to avoid the mistake of the past and so on by remembering what has happened and what is the potential 
of uh, humanity to, <laughs> to, to, to shoot in its own legs and find them. In, in all fairness, we need to move on, but I do want to at least uh, tip a hat to Larry Langer, who always talks about the importance of brokenness and the reality of saving the pieces, even if you put them back together, there is the image of the brokenness. We are all broken. We have all suffered trauma. And so these paintings all talk about that, but they also present the possibility of these pieces being put together, albeit differently than they were originally together. Then we better go on, otherwise we'll be here till tomorrow morning. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, so Sam, yeah, this painting, when I, when I saw it in the exhibition, reminded me that hammer and nails has never been far from your mind. And the show that we did online, actually, of repairs with a question mark inverted is about hammer and nails. And suddenly to see this particular painting from 2003 and to realize that these images have been part of your inner vocabulary. Right. And then from time to time, they pop up and turn into 120 paintings. <laughs> that is right. That is right. And then the inner fire is a very, very important thing because uh, I, I, I think that there is this kind of mystery that I cannot explain. Why do I feel that in certain works of art, there is a validity and in other works not? because I have a certain sense of an inner fire that some things have and some things do not. And, uh, and these tools of creation, the hammer here and so on, it's, they are helping to, to bring out the inner fire and they reveal, they reveal that the book is so very important. And as, as I said before, you, you arrived to our train, Bernie, I said, after all, we are the people of the book. <laughs> so <laughs> so a, the, yeah. book is, uh, the book is, uh, is, is, is quite important. The other phrase, that phrase, that we are the people of the book, Ludwig Lewis in one time said, once the Jews called themselves the people of the book, it meant that they were no longer reading the book. So <laughs> the, and I think yeah, it's really are, sometimes reading the wrong books. Well, well. yeah. <laughs> We're not censoring your work tonight, so we should go on to the next image. Yeah. So this is the piece that they use on the announcement for the exhibition. Um, then can you go forward and look at the little boy of Warsaw and then we can come back to this so that people have one more. Yeah. Um, but I thought we, we there's the black and white image of the little boy of Warsaw that I thought we were going to use. It's my fault. Um, so go back to the- I think piece. everyone knows this very famous photograph is one of the most famous photographs of the little boy. It's uh, even more famous than the photograph of the little girl called Anne Frank. Um, the little boy in the um, group of people that were taken out from a burning house in uh, during the liquidation of the ghetto of Warsaw is very, very famous. And he became for me a kind of a symbol of the million and a half of Jewish children that were murdered in the time of the Holocaust. And I have painted this boy, I think more than a hundred times. I said uh, once in an interview, I would have liked to paint him a million and a half times, if only possible. Uh, this is under the trees of Ponari. Ponari was the place, uh, a very uh, lovely um, suburb of Vilna, um, with a certain a small number of one family homes and so on, where as a child, I used to spend some time in a, in a summer home with my aunt. And I remember during um, the first uh, Soviet uh, occupation, they were digging not far from the house of my aunt. They were digging, the uh, Russian army was digging there. They, they wanted to create there an enormous place for um, gasoline. 
that they will be able to store in the underground, um, under the ground. So they, they dig enormous holes in the ground. And then when the war started and the Germans arrived to Vilnius, they used this digging by the Soviet army to execute people and to throw them in these mass graves. So Ponari or Ponerai, the way they call it in Lithuania today, uh, Ponari became, became the cemetery of, of the Jews of Vilnius. This is where my father is buried. This is where my grandparents are buried. So uh, the wood of Ponari has certainly uh, served as a, as, a, as a background to very many of my paintings. And this um, uh, little silhouette of the boy with the raised arms with an indication of the stripes of the prisoner uniforms of Auschwitz and so on. He, uh, he's a kind of a little, small, uh, humble memorial to, uh, to something that has happened there. In addition, the position of the arms, which is similar to that in the photograph, is also that of the crucifixion and the hands have the nail saloon for the stigmata. So there's a, a clear connection between the little boy of Warsaw, the 1.5 million the children, and all children and women who are caught up in war because they are the ultimate easy victims in each of these situations. In addition, in terms of your own consistent iconography, the use of the X is so often a representation of Xing out or of death. And finally, I think very much so with the trees of Ponari, because I've been there with you on two occasions, the trees are very healthy and very richly done. All these trees are severed. And sometimes they don't even go back together with what they were severed from. So there's a sense of this um, beauty of nature and then the destruction of nature, the loveliness and simplicity and the humility of a child, and yet the child is broken. There is this sort of post Cubist Bach version of how you represent the loss, the brokenness of uh, the universe in a simple uh, image like this in an occasional bullet hole, just to remind us as well, that in addition to shooting people, they kill people in a variety of ways. So it's all in this particular piece under the benign title of Under the Trees mm. uh, of Ponari. Next image. So this, Sam, is at the very uh, foreground as you walk into the exhibition uh, at Montserrat, and it's powerfully presented. It's a relatively large painting. It's 30 by 40. Um, and when I was there at the opening with Kurt, with Lynn, and a number of others, just standing next to it reminded me of this, again, this child, but now a monumental child, sculpted and broken, and then surrounding it, the three incredulous old angels, so to speak, the Trinity. Um, and at the same time, if there's a Father, a Son, and a Holy Ghost, they are surrounding this symbol, if you will, of mankind's uh, ultimate evil, destroying kids. Well, I don't have much to add to it. <laughs> oh, there is one, the, one of the angels that holds this enormous scroll in his hand, which could be maybe a Torah, could, could, could be a holy manuscript, and he kind of turns his head as if asking, could anyone explain to me what has happened? So that's a perfect um, response to the fact that these are not answers. No, they are not answers. Things. No, and, not and this more than, a, and then even in the, to the right shoulder of the little boy, this large stone brings back to mind that when Jews go to a cemetery on the tombstone, they don't place flowers or branches, they put stones. Yes. There's a sense of permanency of the loss itself that needs to be represented. And for me, the consistent opportunity to look at your work is a consistent reminder of we as human beings and our responsibility to certainly refashion this world in a very different way than we're now experiencing it. 
How very right. On to the next one. Persistence of memory. Well, this is 89, so this has a certain age. Uh, well, let you, I, I let you burn. <laughs> well, uh, there, there are not a great many pieces in this exhibition using the pear as an image. So I think it's a very wonderful choice because it does show again, that first show you referred to was all of those eight contemporary um, metaphors, all of which were pairs. And here right. again, coming back to it 30 years later, you still are able to create anew the sense of the world as you see it and experiencing it, and then invite us into that. So this pair is obviously fragmented, it's broken, and then you're allowed into it. And what you find are houses with the windows almost as pleading eyes coming out and then poking up out of it is again the chimney with the smoke that is about to turn to stone. There is a kind of um, permanence to the smoke and ashes that came out of the crematoria that in your paintings will never go away. That's right, that's right. I, um, I, I must say that um, I have used the pear and I call it the fruit of knowledge because um, some artists even did before me uh, painting the pear as the fruit of the forbidden fruit of knowledge of <laughs> of, of, of paradise, the the fruit um, that made uh, poor Adam um, uh, lose um, this very comfortable living quarters and so on. Um, I saw that the pear was much much better to speak of um, knowledge than um, than the apple. And there was certainly something very feminine in the form of the pear that attracted me to use the pear. And whoever uh, has not the ability to see my pear paintings um, in this show, there are not many, uh, can certainly find them on the internet. In the catalogues on there, there are hundreds of pears in very, very uh, different uh, forms. And I, I remember the exhibition for which, uh, Bernie, you have published a wonderful uh, book. Um, so uh, there, there is a lot that the Paris can say. And also because it, it is in many ways a very personal symbolic language that you've taken over. There are dictionaries now where people ask for the meaning of a pair and they frequently say pair 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 as in the art of Samuel Bach. So you have in a sense a, a, a wrong word a, appropriated or appropriated, um, uh, but it has become part of a, an important vocabulary of yours that because it is so personal becomes universal and people then are enabled are allowed to engage with many of the questions that you continue to wrestle with in painting after painting after painting. So next image, please. Well, an image of the ghetto, of the street of the ghetto where domesticity was thrown out into, this, into the street. And you have here the uh, teapot in the background. You have uh, the, 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 the cup of which you have spoken before, the cup that I saw and that amazed me so much in the drawing of this artist whom I was never to meet. Um, it brings something of the, of the memory of my childhood. And I must say that uh, uh, in the Yiddish, um, there is an expression uh, when um, you want to say that somebody is talking nonsense and so on, they say, don't, don't, uh, chop up the teapot. And I remember as a child, I was maybe six or seven years of age and, and our house was full of refugees from uh, the part of Poland that was already uh, occupied by the Nazis. 
and they were speaking of terrible things that were happening uh, in the uh, in 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 the, the uh, part of Poland occupied by the by the Germans, and um, we were living a relatively comfortable life. We were. Um, uh, occupied by the Russians, then we became part of Lithuania and so on. And when these people were speaking of horror, I heard so very often the word, oh, don't break the teapot, don't break the teapot. This will never happen here. So this um, kind of imagined teapot in the background of this cup uh, and, 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 and the, the, the spoon is uh, has something to do with my memory of the uh, the unforeseeable that can be foreseen. Right. Well, the phrase is "haknik and chaini," which yeah. is my grandmother used to repeat in our home any number of times. However, not related to the coming of the Nazis. And the other part of this, having been to Vilna with you, is is the realization of these arches that are actually supported by buildings on both sides of the street. And there is, even to this day, a sense of eeriness in that space. So who have, in, in a sense, littered the street with the height of civility, tea time, creates the contrast of what you experienced there both before the war and then with the war. So once was lovely, civil, all your grandparents, your parents caring for you, life was wonderful. And then the reality of the war and that remains with us as a permanent reminder of what does happen no matter how civilized we think we are. And I think we've made it to the last painting. Yes, the <laughs> carry the way, carry the way. Who are the carriers? Um, it's it's, it's, it's um, uh, very strange because about a week ago or so, I looked at this small painting, it's only 12 by 12 inches. Uh, I painted it about five years ago or so. And I thought, oh my goodness, I did this as a small painting to um, give me a basis for a large painting because the subject to me is very important. The people who carry the memory and how imperfect they are how, and how difficult it is to carry the memory. The, the memory, of course, here is the candle, the candle that is almost burnt out already. And, uh, and if you see, there is even no connection between the, these rods of wood that they hold in their hands, they are disconnected. And even one of them, his arm is disconnected. And I was thinking of history, how history is being told, how history is being debated, how very difficult it is to keep memory because there are always some interests to change history. And in, in a certain sense, when I think of my life and how I was informed of certain things, I realized that there is nothing that changes more than the memory of the past. So all this is loaded <laughs> in this little painting. And I thought, well, one day when I don't feel so much pain in my legs, I will undertake a large painting with <laughs> taking this little one as, 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 as a study for its big composition. But it also has both the memory as you're talking about and using the candle as a vehicle for memory. But at the same time, there is so much disconnectedness that you've already referred to between the arm and the leg, and then there's two sticks that are carrying this candle. And is it a litter? Is it a stretcher that the candle is being borne upon? All of these questions emerge from this. And then the flame itself is actually still going in many of the candle paintings. And the title of that exhibition was Nair Ot. For yeah. those of you who don't know Sam well, punning is a big part of his <laughs> emotional vocabulary. And so the Hebrew word for the plural of candles is nerot. But if you actually divide it into two words, ner and ot, it means the candle as a symbol. The ner is the candle and ot is a symbol. So the whole investment in a single object that all of us are familiar with, a simple burning candle for birthdays, for memorials, and then to put it in the context of memory and having that memory in a sense drip away is incredibly important. 
the exhibition, and I just need to thank Lynn, to thank Kurt, to thank all of the students at Montserrat for the extraordinary curation of the exhibition, plus the fact that many of the students wrote commentaries, probably better than mine and yours, Sam, on many of the pieces that will give you more ideas if ever you see them. <laughs> but it really is a quite extraordinary opportunity to know that all these forces came together to make such an extraordinary opportunity to share your work. Um, so thank you to everyone. Uh, Lynn, uh, thank, particularly thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I, I, I must say, I, I am so very much aware of it that it is enough to paint paintings and they are there, but they come to life only when they are being looked at. And I am so very grateful to all the people who are the creators of this exhibition, who have made also an excellent choice in a, a relatively small number of things that together touch so many themes that I was dealing with. So you have my uh, infinite thanks for um, the work that you have done and my thanks of course to all the people that had the patience to listen to us. Well, I think that is a good cue to open up to our audience questions. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who would like to ask a question. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, I invite um, our audience members to put questions into the into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And I'm happy to um, read, um, read some of those questions and um, or anything that you would like to post to Sam or Bernie. And thank you so much for that really um, enriching conversation. I learned so much more about all of those paintings that I have been looking at for weeks now. And I feel like the number of readings um, in those works is just infinite. And the more you look, the more you learn. And that is so incredibly rewarding and, um, and a, a beautiful way to experience work. Um, I would like to start with sort of a, a matter of maybe a more of a practical question, just as um, questions may be coming into the Q&A, um, because so many of our um, audience members are students. Um, and this was more also just related to the earlier questions um, we were um, talking about earlier with the painting in which you were sort of depicting sort of the artist studio. And I mean, I understand from learning about your work that you work on multiple paintings at once. And maybe you could talk a little bit about how that process is for you. How do you start and stop a painting? How do you move between paintings? And how do you know a painting is finished? Well, I, I have already, I think, spoken about it and, and also written about it. You, you, you can never finish a painting, but you have to finish with it. So my way of finishing with it, not 100%, partly, is have it photographed and have it put in a book or uh, then I do not dare very much to go on finishing it because finishing is infinite. And uh, just um, a few days ago, I was brought a painting from the gallery that uh, had a little accident and I had, could repair it very easily and so on. But when I had this painting that I painted maybe 10 years ago and so on in my studio, I said, oh my goodness, I should change this here, I should change that here. And, then, and it already happened to me in the past. I see Bernie smiling uh, because <laughs> the, he remembers a painting that he sent to me and I repainted it and I changed. So in terms of knowing how to change, but a painting can exist in so many ways. For instance, I give you an example. Right now, I have painted a small painting, a certain landscape. And then I, I came one morning, I said, mm, I could have actually done it a little differently. So I painted it a little differently. Today, I came in my studio. I had 10 little different paintings, all based on that little painting that I was not really very sure about. And then it didn't matter anymore because every painting was telling me what it needed. One painting was telling me, look, that tree is a little too close to the, to the other tree. So the white of the sky is too small compared to the balance that it would need 
according to the corner, which is on the right or on the left and so on. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's a living process and um, you just deal with it. You know that there is, we, we, we do not live, we do not work in terms of the absolute, like the absolute truth. Does it exist? I'm not sure. So painting is the same way. I mean, you, you do the best that you can at a certain point. You realize that behind you, there are thousands of unpainted paintings that are queuing up and they say, hurry up, hurry up. We have to come here to your studio. And so this is more or less how uh, I deal with it. Uh, then I would just add, when Sam referred to a painting, there was a painting uh, called Round Table of a chess gathering around a very beautiful table. And it was in fact in a book. We reproduced it there. Sam took the painting back and totally rearranged the characters. And then someone got in touch with us about the painting as he saw it in the book and wanted to buy it. And I said, well, let me tell you, that painting doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> but another one does exist based upon it. And it's on top of that. And ultimately, he saw the second version and ended up and wanted it and owns it. Mm -hmm. But yes, the process for Sam is um, and also there are deadlines, which um, I must yeah. say in all fairness, after whatever, 54 years of working together, Sam is always ahead of the deadline, never behind it. So the reality of having to have a certain number of works available to have them photographed by a certain time makes a huge difference. And then says, okay, you have another 10, 20, 50, 100 in the works. The critical thing I think for everyone who sees Sam's paintings is to think about the 9,000 works of art and then realize that every one of them as if it is a short story and then figure out how many lives that would take a normal person. <laughs> so. I, I think I'm very normal, Bernie. Yeah, I, uh, I'll go with that too. <laughs> and someone what? is um, also as a sort of a related and follow-up question, someone is asking if you make preparatory studies to your paintings. Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, sometimes I do a series of drawings and um, because I want to develop certain ideas and then I um, turn some of these drawings into paintings. Most um, of the time I do the drawing on the canvas itself. I make changes in the drawing and so on. And what I have done as preparatory work is under the finished work. So at least, I mean, this limits, fortunately, the number of my things that are crowding the catalog on of my work. There are so many works that are one under another. But then paintings really have a life of their own, at least, I mean, to me, they have a life of their own and they tell me what they need. So um, after I begin a painting, I don't have to think about it too much. I just have to follow the logic that it um, demands from me to put everything in place. So the whole idea is to put things in place. So I'm trying to do my best with that. Well, thank you for that a really wonderful answer. Um, I have another question. Um, I wanted to ask one thing that has really, um, fascinated me with in sort of learning about your work and showing your work is, is the very discretionary manner in which you depict the human figure. And the human figure is, I mean, there's the, the, the image of the boy which you um, and Bernie so beautifully talked about, as well as the image at the end with the two men carrying the candle um, and other images that depict the figure of justice or Adam and Eve, or sometimes a figure of a man, but you're very, the figure is very placed very carefully. And um, can, in thinking about sort of the historical events and the human suffering that, and, 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 um, and just atrocity that afflicted people, there are so few people in your paintings. And I wanted to just ask a little bit about that. Why, um, sort of your thought process around the way in which the figure is kind of represented and depicted and symbolized and memorialized in your paintings. Before Sam answers, let me just invite you to the next exhibition and the next monograph called Figuring Out. It's 
So it is 120 odd paintings or 132, sorry, uh, paintings all featuring figures. So I don't think there is a painting in this entire body of work that is devoid of figures. And in my view, uh, having read both Larry Langer's essay and Andy Meyer's essay, um, emphasizing the fact that in, these are some of the most important individual paintings Sam has done because the human figure is now present. No metaphors, no chess, no pairs, no candles, but figures. And then they are caught up in the world of Sam's other vocabulary, but the figure is primary in this next exhibition. And that opens March the 5th and is on for about six weeks. So um, there'll be a monograph with it. There'll be a number of webinars around it, but it, it hopefully will stand as visual evidence that Sam does like figures. <laughs> well, I really look forward to that. Um, and are these, uh, the paintings in the exhibition, are they recent works um, or yeah. taken from? No, they're all so, recent works. They're all recent I mean, works. The last, last three, three, four years. Mm -hmm. Well, that's wonderful. I, I, my ideal, my ideal is to have about a hundred paintings in work. And, and that they spend about two years with me. <laughs> uh, because then I can every day pick up uh, something between, I don't know, eight or 12 paintings, look at each one, see something that it needs here and there, and then put away, forget it. And 10 days after that, get back and see if it was right what I have done, have a kind of a fresh look at the things. So if you put 10 paintings on average a day, 10 days between painting and painting, my ideal number of works in work is about a hundred. So this answers maybe <laughs> some questions that people ask uh, uh, about the number of paintings that I'm uh, doing. I never start and finish one painting, no. It is always in a process of being created and, uh, and, and, and changing sometimes quite uh, strongly. Sometimes the sky is clear and sometimes the sky becomes dark. And then a certain wind comes there in the morning where I enter the studio and I decide that the sky is too dark and, um, and, and there is uh, enough oil um, in the tubes on my table to make the sky clearer, which is much more difficult in reality. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing these new images. I'd like to, maybe we'll have time for one more question. And, and this one question coming from our audience seems like a poignant one to, um, to end on. Um, they ask, I love the idea of using your art to teach about anti-Semitism and evil, not only as history, but over time in our time. How has your art been impacted by not only the past, but by the present as you create it? Oh, my art is constantly is constantly inspired by the present. I, I, I live in the present day, and the big problems of the present are the problems that uh, that, uh, that touch me. And I, I, I think that I personally, like uh, uh, a few hundred uh, millions of other people who live in this country, live um, in, in, in a system that does not very much um, like to learn from mistakes of others. It kind of dreams of making its own mistakes. So, uh, and I'm a little troubled by it. And um, my paintings, even if they seemingly speak of the past or of anti-Semitism, some people speak anti-Semitism, I'm not concerned about it. I, what, con what concerns me is the human condition. And, and mainly the, 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 the lack of justice for people who just chose the wrong parents in the wrong time, in the wrong neighborhood. And why don't they have the same possibility that have others who are born in a nice suburb and so on. So I live in the present, I live in the present. And of course, all these things like anti-Semitism and so on, they, 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 they trouble me, but uh, so does the attitude to people that have a different color of skin or a different shape of eyes or uh, uh, all these things touch me enormously. 
enormously. I'm, I'm, I'm the very proud uh, grandfather of two um, grandsons. One is uh, 19 and one 13 who have dark skin and they are part of me. And this is a wonderful thing to know that I have children that re and grandchildren that represent another part of the world that is my part. So <laughs> I live here and now. Then I, I would just add to that, that if when we did our first show of Sam's work uh, in 1968, the two newspapers that reviewed the show were the Harvard Crimson and the MIT newspaper. And both of those papers and reviews felt that Sam's work was the most contemporary work being done because what he was doing was responding to the contemporary world in which those students were living. And they were aware and alert to it. And that approach that is, they recognized then is available today in 2022. That mm -hmm. Sam's awareness of the world around him is transformed just as the past that he experienced as a child is transformed into art and then into massive questions about human behavior, human choice, moral choice, and making somehow an effort to both recognize the past so that our present and the future will be incredibly different. And so far, I think both of us would admit that we failed. So we keep trying, that's all. There's an effort to alert people and these paintings are all about making people aware and making them stand up. So you both have wonderful paintings and works of art filled with questions that can energize all of us to behave in a very different way. And let's hope that happens. Those are wonderful, hopeful, um, and encouraging answers. And how fortunate we are not only to have you, Sam, to be able to paint these questions for us and to paint these poignant um, memories and history and, um, and your experiences. And we're fortunate and privileged to have art to help guide us through that. Thank you so much. And I would, I don't see, I think we've been keeping people for an hour and a half, even though we had a little delay. I want to just thank you so deeply, Sam, for being here with us tonight and for sharing your work and your, your thoughts and your ideas and um, with, with Montserrat and our audiences. And thank you so much, Bernie, for sharing your incredible insights into Sam's work. It's been uh, an honor to collaborate with you on this exhibition. And um, again, I apologize to our audiences for the little bit of a delay, but I think we had a wonderful and enriched conversation. And um, I really thank you both. So you. Um, I think thank that we will, we will part there. And um, just for our listeners, this, um, this uh, webinar has been recorded and will be posted um, somewhere on our website um, in, uh, the, soon, maybe next week. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Have <laughs> okay. a good night. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much and good night.